What on earth is that? Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Here's a really strange Gibson that showed up a couple of months ago on Reverb. It certainly piqued my interest, but not in a good way, more so in a, hey, I want to know what this thing actually started life as, because there's no way this left the factory looking like this, right? So I start to scroll through all these photos. I see an interesting Restored by Valdez on the truss rod cover, so that tells me about everything we need to know. Yeah, it didn't leave the factory looking like this. However, our headstock is looking good, and we do have a legit serial number. So, some of this is Gibson, but how much? Looking at the fretboard inlays, we can tell it's a real mother of pearl and they're small blocks, and we have a rosewood fretboard that does indeed have binding. So pretty much the only thing within the solid body electric guitar world that that would match would be an early SG standard of the mid 70s. And looking at our headstock, it's about the right size. We've got a logo of the period. We also have the crown inlay that they would also have. And yeah, that's totally a serial number that would happen. And this was a style of tuner that Gibson used in the early 70s. Typically when it comes to the SG standards, it's only the really early ones that have this one before they switch into the newer Schaller style. So I would hazard a guess this is somewhere around a late 72 to an early 74 Gibson SG neck. So having that knowledge, let's take a look at the body now. I was curious, did this actually look like an SG at one point and it's just been horribly disfigured? Well, overlay a normal SG over top of this and yeah, unless they're adding wood in certain locations, probably not. What I see here looks like a seam line where they joined two pieces of wood to a plank within the body. So kind of like a Gibson Firebird, but since we have wood in this area that wouldn't quite line up with the original SG horn, so I'm assuming this is some sort of a Gibson neck that was thrown onto some sort of a project. Restored by Valdez, more like custom project by Valdez. But it looks like we have DiMarzio pickups in here. We still have the harmonica bridge, but holy cow, that's gonna be uncomfortable to play. Yeah, those posts are not supposed to be sticking that far up. And then we've got a regular tailpiece. The knobs look of the era. We've got a mini toggle to split our pickups. That's always fun. And a regular three-way selector switch. But now we flip it over to the back. You can see, once again, those seam lines we were talking about. But then we have some sort of an engraving in the back here that says Mitchell. But depending on the way you look at it, it could say Sitchell. It just has a fancy start to your letter C right there. And it looks like they put the output jack on the side. And this kind of helps show us how they join the woods together. Looks like they have some sort of a splicing piece of wood in between them on top of the wood glue. But ah, cool, we do have a cavity shot here. It doesn't look like they're original Gibson style pots. And I can't see all the pot codes to see what brand they are. But it's possible they could date to 1976 if these are CTS. So yeah, kind of BC Rich meets Gibson. But the other reason I had to check this thing out is it was initially listed for $20,000. So this shop in California must have thought they had something special. So I've been following this one the past couple of months. Back in February, the shop actually decided to list it on eBay as an open auction. Their starting price was $1,204. Not surprisingly, it didn't get any bids at all. So now they have the reverb price cut all the way down to $9,900. And they also have it on eBay for five and a half thousand. Realistically, based on everything I know here, these vintage pickups, what, probably worth 200, 300 bucks. Since we don't have all the correct hardware for their harmonica bridge, I'd probably just throw 50 bucks on those. The knobs, probably worth about 100. The tuners could sell between 100 and 200, but we'll take the low end for this. The neck appears to be in pretty worn shape, but you could potentially release that from the body if you needed to restore a different SG. So let's say uh, 300 bucks on the neck. And personally, I wouldn't put any value on the body itself. So you're looking at a rough $750 part out value. So if you're looking to buy this thing to love it and play it, I would suggest trying to get it for 600 to 650. Although I'm not sure if the seller would actually accept that offer. But when it comes to weird guitars that have been all mashed together, many times the part out value is the best way to understand how much the market might pay. But I don't know about you guys, but I'm really curious about this Valdez guy. I hadn't heard of him before. So I did a Google search and I found another one of his creations. I found this flying V of his over on TuneYourSound.com. And like, wow, this is infinitely better. It looks like we've got some sort of a mid 70s flying V that a custom wooden pick guard has been made for. And then they converted it all to gold hardware. 
everywhere. So gold pickups, gold Gibson TP6 tailpiece with a Nashville style bridge, but we've got a similar triangle layout knob. It looks like we got another coil splitter switch over here with our toggle switch down here, and then our output jack right underneath the controls, so definitely 67 in style. And the listing states it's a Carina body, however, that looks like mahogany to me, but who knows? Kind of an interesting location for your strap button. But now looking at our fretboard, it's unbound, rosewood, your acrylic dot inlays, so that lines up with a 70s flying V neck. But then it's got somebody's name down here, Lori Papas, 1978, that's pretty cool. Then our headstock, look, we've got a Gibson logo, just like the recent Hendrix flying V reissue that we documented. But this one also reads Restored by Valdez. So normally in this era, you would have some screw holes over here and then one up here for our truss rod cover that just reads Gibson on it. So he had to have put this new Gibson logo, which is an authentic logo, I can tell you that. So either that or he perfectly copied it and then laid it in there. So there's definitely been some work on the neck. Those are definitely replacement tuners. The shape looks about right. However, I'm not seeing a serial number. To me, the body does not look right. So I think this is another example of maybe a Gibson neck on top of a custom body. I mean, that's pretty evident by the custom control plate back here. <laughs> And unfortunately, those are the only two guitars that I could find listed under the Restored by Valdez branding. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't other ones, because I did a little bit more research, and I came across this website, kcrw.com. They named Arturo Valdez the guitar maker of the stars. So here's what they had to say about him. Apparently, Mr. Valdez has a guitar shop on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And from the vibes of the article, it kind of looks a little bit run down, and you might actually think it's closed, but he's just in there working on his guitar. But at the time this article was written, he was 78 years old, but the article itself has aged 11 years, so that puts him at almost 90 years old now. But he specializes in flamenco guitars, and he builds custom instruments for rock stars, and he also gives lessons at $70 an hour. But apparently this is the guy who built the Kiss Battle Axe. That's a pretty iconic guitar. But he's also made instruments for John Lennon, Rick Derringer, John Denver, and Eric Clapton. Looks like even for the Talking Heads, Elvis Costello, Rick J. James, Journey, and even Van Halen. So maybe this is just one of those things where the name didn't necessarily ring a bell to me, but maybe it does to other people. Because that's where a part at value doesn't necessarily make sense when you have history and lineage behind it. But apparently he got into building guitars around 1965 when he was just a city bus driver. So he thought he could sell lessons on the side and he just slowly learned how to build his own guitars. So it kind of seemed to be a learn as you go type thing. So perhaps this is one of his earlier works that was custom commissioned by this Mitchell fellow who wanted something kind of BC Rich-esque and then maybe this Flying V was slightly later on. It's hard to tell but these are certainly interesting pieces of history. But here was another fun thing that showed up on eBay. It was listed as Giant Gibson Replica Guitar for a thousand bucks. So of course I had to click on this thing. That doesn't look that big. Maybe what, five feet tall? It looks like a photo opportunity. But then you get this angle and you go, Oh, <laughs> that's a ceiling of a building. Like a six foot tall guy might come up to right here. Oh, hey, yeah, great. They actually do have a person standing by it. So it's probably like 25 feet tall. <laughs> How are you supposed to ship this thing? So apparently this is made out of foam core insulation sheets built upon a wooden frame. And their dimensions say it's about 20 feet tall. So hey, my estimations weren't too off. And how do you ship it? You don't, you must pick it up. Well, when it comes to giant signs, I mean, it's actually kind of cool. And since we've got a little bit of time left, let's do some traditional guitar hunting. So somebody had sent me a photo to this one. It's called a Gibson Custom Proto Grape Fire. So naturally, prototypes are pretty cool. And Purple Les Pauls used to be very rare, although they're definitely starting to become a little bit more common thanks to the mod collection and a whole bunch of different custom orders with the Made to Measure division. But this one definitely is a very grapey color. But this particular one is actually listed as a prototype on the back of the headstock. You'll just have to trust me because it seems these Japanese brokers have updated their listings to not show it anymore. But when I first looked at this listing, it, it is written prototype on the back, so that kind of makes that cool much better than buying a regular made to measure or a mod collection in my opinion because even the most expensive broker only wants 6200 and this one's just under six grand i mean for a cool prototype that's well worth it however if you're interested in that i did look it up i think it's actually sold at the shop so if you actually buy it here you're probably just going to get a refund 
But where was this thing back in November? This is the case I was looking for for my SG Les Paul. Now, I already bought a slightly later 60s one, so I'm not that interested in trying to get the original, original case since I already spent my small budgeted money that I had left for that. But who knows, this thing might get bit up like crazy. Like, I would gladly pay 500 for it. But the fact that we have this thing in it, that's cool. The Sideway Vibrola. I bet this little piece of paper is actually worth a little bit of money on its own. It's funny how a case can tell such a story. Like you can tell a strap was stored with the guitar right there by the horn, maybe even something over here. Definitely had lots of players wear on it. I suppose I'll watch this. If it doesn't get any bids, it, it might be worth that. However, if we're being real here, this one looks a lot more beat up than would probably match my 62 SG. But you can check out that review and demo if you want to learn that cool heartwarming tale of how I came across that. Or if you want to be the next owner of it. Alright, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.